Congratulations, YouTube. You did it. You wore me down and you sucked me back in. I have too many subscribers here just to walk away entirely, especially with no alternative that truly stacks up and so many copycat channels uploading my shows for me anyway. But we can't forget the THC's account here is on thin ice. And so the YouTube version of the show has to be prefaced with this little PSA, only to say that episodes that contain the kinds of themes that have been regularly banned on YouTube will not appear here. And even with that precaution, there's already enough in the archive to get us removed, so remember that the higher side chats could be banned or put in timeout again at any time. And I won't be able to tell you guys about it. So if you feel like it's been too long since you've heard from me here on this digital, dystopian, draconian, data mining monster of a police state seeking platform, your first step should be to check the HigherSideChats.com for the latest shows. All right? All right. Enjoy. Brace yourself, because you're about to dive into another free first hour episode of the Higher Side Chats. And we just want to let you know that whether you're looking for a companion through your paranoid insomnia, entertaining yourself through one of life's mundane activities, or trying to ward off the internal screams of all those sad, smothered souls around the office, THC is here. And you should know that every episode of the Higher Side Chats has an entire second hour for Plus members. Sign up at the HigherSideChatsPlus.com and you'll get years of Plus show archives, lifetime forum access, a special invite to Greg Carlwood's monthly joint sessions, MP3s of THC music, bonus episodes, tour videos, and 10% off t-shirts, grinders, and whatever else ends up in the Higher Side store. It's $8 a month that you won't miss, so become a Plus member and treat yourself in these troubled times. Always action-packed and commercial-free, which means you'll unfortunately never hear my voice again. Masters almost surely have a plan There's clearly maybe something there beyond the realm of man Until we've thoroughly tested every last close-chested view Find the more you think you know, the less you really do Where would we be without THC? We know the lying to us just don't know to what degree Where would we be without THC? Greg Carwood and Company All right, higher side chatters, when we dig into the details of many subjects that are generally taken for granted, we find a great deal of manipulation, half-truths, and faulty premises in which entire fields are sometimes based, and this goes for an increasingly large chunk of history and science. Materialism, Darwinism, the Apollo moon missions, Columbus discovering America, mass shootings, 9-11, the cover-up of exotic technology and alternative fuel sources, genuine medicine, historic timelines, and maybe even some major elements of our earthly system itself. Everybody draws their lines differently, but these are just some of the examples we've examined in the past that actually encompass huge portions of popular worldviews and to see through even just a few of them leads one to reflect on not only what else we take for granted that could possibly be concocted by the capstone cabal, but just how powerful and all-encompassing are the nefarious few. What kind of world am I in? Are we as blissfully ignorant of our true situation as the cattle grazing on the farm? Well, when the big club goes back further than we can trace our own family lines and we're forced to go through the brainwashing education system that has been cooked up by those very same untrustworthy tyrants, Good luck getting it all worked out. As the theme song says, we know they're lying to us, we just don't know to what degree. Well, today we're blowing the barn doors right off the hinges and torching every sacred cow left inside. Because today's guest, John LeBon, pushes the needle firmly into the red as he tackles some of what seem to be the most controversial and tightly held so-called truths out there. John is a self-described real skeptic from Australia, just asking questions about what we take for granted, he runs johnlebon.com as well as a popular YouTube channel, and I think this is going to be a pretty wild ride. 
the controversial question asker, the full spectrum skeptic and conspiratorial thunder from down under, JLB, welcome to the higher side. What a fantastic introduction. Thank you very much, Greg, for having me. And yeah, let's see where this goes. I do cover a lot of topics on my website and on my YouTube channel. So this could go in any direction, but I've been looking forward to it all week. So thank you very much for having me on the show. Yeah, man, you got it. I'm really looking forward to it, too. We kind of got hooked up as I was digging more into what we could call the history hoax and alternative timelines and just looking at how much of that could have been fabricated. And as I got to your site, I found that you get into quite a few other areas that maybe I'm not so into, and that's okay. But broadly speaking, I think we share a lot in common. People should re-examine everything we take for granted. We shouldn't build our worldviews on premises that are tied to deceptive organizations. And really, before people defend something they hold dear, they should know more about where it really comes from. And oftentimes, things are just beliefs instilled from the school system and reinforced by Hollywood. But I guess before we dive into the history hoax, which I think is the overarching thing here, I thought a good way to start would be for the unfamiliar listeners to maybe get a feel for your overall perspective by walking us up your hoax hierarchy a bit, if you'd be all right with it. Yeah, let's talk about the hoax hierarchy. This is something that seems to draw a lot of people to the YouTube channel and to the website. Basically, what I did was a couple of years ago, I sat down and I thought, if I was to go through the different things that I think are hoaxes, or that there may be some deception involved, are some of them maybe more significant than others? And so I started drawing up a schematic from the what I call the baby hoaxes right through to the granddaddy hoax. And the way that it worked out was it kind of was easiest to visualize as a triangle. So down the bottom, I've got a bunch of major media events that I believe are hoaxes. And I'm not sure how much your audience likes to discuss these things, but there are events such as, say, Sandy Hook or the Boston bombings, which if you look at some of the photo or video evidence from the events, they're highly suspicious. Mm -hmm. And that was actually how I got into conspiracy culture maybe four or five years ago. But subsequent to that, I've learned that these major media events, as significant as they are, they're actually not as significant as perhaps some of the other deceptions that I've learned about. And so what I did was I just drew up this schematic and I called it the hoax hierarchy. And my idea wasn't to convince people that what I think are the big hoaxes are more important than what I think are the less important hoaxes. It's more of a way to try to conceptualize what effects do some of these deceptions have on our minds and on our lifestyles. And so I'm happy to talk with you today about any of the hoaxes on that hoax hierarchy. And if you're interested to explain to you why I think some of those things are hoaxes, because a lot of them, they are controversial. To some people, some of the things that I'm saying are hoaxes, they're going to find that aggravating for me to sit here and say that, for example, history, parts of it may be a hoax. I do understand that that's going to come across as a little bit disconcerting to people, but hopefully they can give us a chance here today, Greg, and I can explain why every single one of those items on that hoax hierarchy is, in my opinion, a hoax. <laughs> For sure, man. And by the nature of it, I think most people would be on board with the bottom. And as we go up, we would probably lose some people along the way. That's just the nature of these types of rabbit holes. But we've been doing this a long, long time. And I think most people consider things like 9-11, or the Boston bombing, Sandy Hook, Aurora, the whole Bin Laden thing, the Apollo missions, a lot of the things you have in the baby, toddler, and kitty levels, I'm pretty sure we've digested enough there to be on board with that. And if we were to get to maybe those middle levels, I mean, I don't even want to put out a specific thing. I guess what, what when you get to those teeny and kitty levels, what do you think are the kind of the most polarizing things that you think you can make the best case for. All right, then. So let's talk about some of those teeny hoaxes. But before we do, just to make sure that people are on board with this, say at the baby hoax level, I've got Boston bombings and Sandy Hook and these kinds of things. And you might remember that a couple of years ago, there was the ISIS beheading serial show on TV. So what they were doing on the news was they were saying that ISIS, this 
boogeyman terrorist group had captured these captives and they were going to behead them. And they even had each beheadee call out the next person who was going to be beheaded. So it was like a TV serial. I'm not sure if you remember this, but it was to me clearly almost like a comical, fictional boogeyman TV show. Hmm. But it wasn't portrayed as a fictional show. It was portrayed as real. And so I've got that down there at the baby hoax level as well. So I think that some of what we're shown on the news, it is clearly fabricated, right. including a lot of what we're told about the terrorists and the boogeymen and that kind of thing. And then up from the baby hoax level, I've got the toddler hoaxes, and those are Osama bin Laden and the Apollo missions. And already here, we might lose some people. So look at Osama bin Laden. Regardless of what people think about what happened on 9-11, to me, Osama bin Laden, he is a fictional boogeyman. If you look at the footage of him, there's plenty of YouTube videos that people have recorded from CNN or from any uh, news agency, and they've re-uploaded them to YouTube. So we can see what was being shown about Osama bin Laden in the 1990s and the 2000s. And I look at this footage, and he too comes across as a fictional boogeyman. He comes across as the kind of character who would be in like a 1950s or a 1960s escapade where the protagonist has to take down the boogeyman, that's how Osama bin Laden is shown to me. And so I tried to look further into the Osama bin Laden story, and I'm not convinced that this person was a real person. I think Osama bin Laden, regardless of what we think of 9-11, Osama bin Laden strikes me as he may have been a fictional boogeyman, Greg, and I know that will come across as controversial, but if we look at some of the texts that have been given to the masses that I think might be what you might call truth in plain sight, we know that, say, in 1984 by George Orwell, Goldstein is a fictional boogeyman, and he's put on the telescreen, and the masses are welcomed to have their two minutes of hate. You know, everybody hates Goldstein. They hate the boogeyman. Well, isn't that what Osama bin Laden was for us? He was the boogeyman on TV who we were encouraged to project our hatred onto, but we only ever see him on the telescreen. Our entire relationship with Osama bin Laden is via the mainstream media. None of us have ever met him. None of us will ever meet him. We're told now that he's dead. He is purely a representation on our television screens and in our newspapers. And then you've got the Apollo missions, which... I would hope, Greg, I'm hoping that most of your listeners are familiar with the fact, the obvious fact, that that was an entirely fabricated event as well. I think so. Nobody went to the moon, 1969 through 1972, and the footage that we were shown of people playing golf on the moon and driving dune buggies and even speaking with the president on the phone, again, to me, this isn't just that we've been deceived, but the deception is comical. It's almost like a comic book style, a load of nonsense to me. So if we just stop at the toddler level there, Greg, would you say that most of your listeners would agree with at least the Apollo missions and hopefully the Osama bin Laden element as well, or at least be open-minded to the possibility that it wasn't that Osama bin Laden was framed. He was actually created for the purpose of framing. So far, would you say that this isn't too controversial just yet? Not at all. I think people are pretty on board, at least open to the possibility. On some of these things, for example, you move up a level, you got 9-11, no planes. We don't need to spend a ton of time on this, but I think that what's relevant is that it was a fabricated event. It was a false flag. The buildings were taken down. I think the buildings were built to be taken down as part of a ritual later, and that's a big thing. But I think sometimes the people who are woke, so to speak, end up devolving their arguments into, well, was it nanothermite? Was it a mini nuke? Were there planes there? Was it a direct energy weapon? You know, I have the place that I'd put my bet, but I think what's relevant is that it's not as projected and we've been lied to by the people that are our so-called protectors. I mean, after that, I really don't care what a person thinks necessarily. I'm just not hung up on that as long as they're on board with the fact that it was a fabrication. I mean, because that's really, to me, the thing that's hardest to accept, but perhaps not. But I guess just take us up the pyramid and give us some of the cliff notes up until like our main topic. 
Oh, good. Well, I'm so glad to hear you say that, that you think that the towers were built to be brought down. Because when I first heard that theory put forward, I thought, how could that possibly be? Why would they do such a thing? Why would they build these gigantic towers, two of them, in uh, the middle of New York and bring them down on TV? Why would they do such a thing? Whereas now it's quite obvious to me that those towers were, in fact, built to be brought down as part of a big ritual, as you describe it. So I'm glad we're on the same page on that one. So if we move up to the teeny hoax level, I've got five things listed there. And I would ask the listeners to at least hear us out before they get too frustrated by what I have to say. Let's just go through them and and see if maybe there's some good reason to think that maybe we've been deceived about some of these things. All right. On the teeny hoax level, I've got dinosaurs, atoms, war, evolution, and heliocentrism. And I am suggesting that each of those five things we may have been deceived about. (laughs) So you choose one of those five, Greg. You tell me which of those five you think your listeners would be most interested to hear more about. And let's go from there. (laughs) And this is the kind of the middle of the pyramid, folks. (laughs) Don't forget that. Um, I think evolution, people would be pretty on board with. There's major deceptions there. We've covered heliocentrism, I think, at nauseum. I'm kind of interested in why you put war on there. Okay, so you and I, we're roughly the same age. We're both in our 30s, right? Mm -hmm. So we've been raised to believe that about 100 years ago, there was a gigantic world war where millions of people died. And then a couple of decades after that, there was another world war where millions of people died. Millions of innocent people died, and that was what happened. You know, it was this horrible calamity. Now, I'm not saying that those events didn't happen, but what I am saying is that one day I decided to look into, well, what is the evidence that all of these people died? You know, we're given these figures, these death counts of tens of millions of people, and maybe tens of millions of people did die. I'm not sure. I mean, it could be possible. But when I started looking into the evidence, what I found was that it was largely based on secondhand accounts. It was largely based on aggregate numbers that were given by official outlets. And in terms of sort of empirical evidence for these deaths, there's really not much that the average person can see to verify the claims that are being made. There are grave sites in various parts of Europe where you can still go and see, you know, where people have been buried as a result of dying in the war and what have you. So it seems to me as though people did die and there was a major event. But in terms of the numbers that we're given, we're given numbers of millions and millions and millions of people all around the world dying in this major calamity. And I wonder how much of that is legitimate. And if we fast forward through to today, people my age and people your age, well, we've been raised two generations or more after World War II. So unless we have a strong faith in history, we don't really have much reason to take anything that we're told on face value. It's either you have faith in what you're told or you don't. And I no longer have faith in what I'm told. So I've got the war hoax there, not because I'm saying that nothing has ever happened or nothing bad has ever happened. But once I started looking into it, I saw that there's not as much evidence for some of these claims as I thought there was. And then if we look at more recent wars, such as the Gulf War and what's been happening in the Middle East, I find a lot of that to be very dubious as well. And I can give you some examples. Sure. If you look at the bombing of Baghdad, there's still footage of it on YouTube to this day. You can see the footage that somebody has uploaded from the the official news broadcasts of the time. I would encourage all of your listeners just to one day look up bombing of Baghdad, watch it for yourself, and just see if you notice anything about the footage. Because when I watch that footage, I think to myself, This does look, again, comical. This doesn't look like a real bombing at all. This kind of looks like a pyrotechnics display. It almost looks like a fireworks display that's being presented to us. And we're just supposed to accept that this is a real war and a real bombing. Now, if people still believe that Saddam Hussein was truly an enemy of the United States, I can completely understand why they would think that this was a real bombing. Oh, the Americans went into Iraq and they were bombing Saddam Hussein because they wanted to take him out. I can understand why people would believe that narrative. I used to believe that narrative. 
But as you progress through thinking about some of these topics and the process that I call deprogramming, you start to question, well, hold on, the people who run the show, do they really have enemies? Was Saddam Hussein really against the American establishment? Or was he a puppet dictator who was put there? Because if he was a puppet dictator, then why would the US have any reason to bomb him to try and take him out? Wouldn't he be in on the whole thing? And then people try to tell me, oh, no, Iraq really was against the Americans. They were really at war with each other. Iraq was a separatist state, and they wanted to start selling their oil in, in a different currency. They wanted to fight the petrodollar. And again, I used to believe all of that until I tried to look for actual evidence that this was the case, and I couldn't find any. And a country like Iraq, if you just look at it on a map, it's a fictional country from the outset. It was created after World War II. That's why they have these straight lines as their borders. It was created after the breakup of the Ottoman Empire. And the Ottoman Empire was broken up, we're told, by the establishment. So how could the establishment create countries like Iraq and then lose control of them? It doesn't make sense to me. So if this is the first time that someone's heard someone suggest these kinds of things, I completely understand, Greg, why they sound too out there. It must sound to people like I'm almost making this up for the sake of being like a shock jock or something. Mm -hmm. But all I'm trying to encourage people to do is to think about why do we believe what we're told? Take, for instance, World War I. Here in Australia, we, as children, we're encouraged once a year to buy these little red poppies and to wear them and have this minute of silence on Remembrance Day for all of these people who've died. So as little children who are, you know, children are very empathic and it's easy for their emotions to be manipulated. Well, these little children who've done nothing wrong to anyone in a ritual once per year, they're encouraged to wear these little red poppies and for a minute to stand in silence and to remember all of these dead people they've never met. Now, if you go to school for, say, 12 years, then that means that on at least 12 occasions, you've had to stand there in silence with all of the people around you. In, you have to be solemn and you have to remember the deaths of people you've never met. And I'm suggesting to you, Greg, and I'm suggesting to all of your listeners, maybe that kind of conditioning on us during school has a far more profound effect than we realize. And maybe that's why when someone comes along and says, yeah, but what's the evidence that millions of people died? We have a natural aversion to what they're saying because we've had all of these conditioning, all of this emotional manipulation while we're growing up. We're so convinced there must have been these millions of people dead because we've already mourned for them. But in terms of actual evidence, no, we were never given any other than second and third head in the counts from the very authorities and establishment that at other times, we say that we challenge them and we question them. But on these kinds of topics, we won't even open our minds to the possibility that maybe we have been deceived. Mm -hmm. Well, I think you make some good points, man. And I chose war out of that category just because I felt like I knew more or less what you would say about dinosaurs or atomic weapons or evolution or heliocentrism, just because... Those are kind of more defined arguments, and war is kind of a big thing. Also, most of history is based on war, and that's the overarching topic. And I don't want to be too argumentative. That's not my style. I do genuinely respect your thought process. Call it skepticism or the trivium or a personal application of it. But to default to hoax on anything that you can't personally prove just seems too rigid or simplistic to me because there will be some things you can't prove that are conventional ideas. I mean, it's kind of ironic, but you realize there's a lot of people using your same type of logic to doubt the existence of Australia itself, right? You know, it's very interesting that you say that because in the preparation for this call, I went back and listened to some of your more recent podcasts and sure. I saw that when you were chatting with Gordon White, and that was a good call, by the way, I enjoyed that. You did mention that you were a little bit frustrated by conspiracy culture because lately people have been saying that the earth is flat or that australia is a hoax and i hadn't actually heard the australia hoax one that, that one's interesting obviously i live here in australia so maybe i'm involved in some grand conspiracy mm -hmm. to deceive the world about australia but i think it's a real place i'm here right now so i don't believe in the australia hoax 
And as for flat earth, I can understand people's frustration with that as well because I have released 50 videos, okay? In the space of a couple of years, I released no less than 50 different YouTube videos debunking and critiquing the flat earth so-called theory. And it's not really a theory. It's more of a conjecture or a fantasy that a lot of these people have that the earth is flat. And unfortunately for me, a lot of people assumed that I was a flat earther because I used to host a show called the Ball Earth Skeptic Roundtable. And this was back in 2015, back when flat earth was just starting to become a thing on YouTube. So I interviewed some of the biggest names in flat earth. I interviewed Mark Sargent. I interviewed Eric Dubay, Geronism, Wakey Wakey. A lot of the big names then, and some of them are still big names today, I interviewed them. And what happened was that because I would describe myself as a ball earth skeptic, and that was the name of the show, and I was interviewing all of these leading flat earthers, a lot of people assumed that I too was a flat earther. However, what I was doing was asking some of these guys questions about basic problems that I see with the flat earth belief system, such as... There are two pole stars, okay? There's a pole star in the north, and there is a pole star here in the south. How can the flat earth belief system account for that? Or southern flights. You can fly from South Africa to Australia in the space of about nine hours. And I know that because I did that back in 2010 on the way home from the Soccer World Cup. So I would bring these problems up with these leading flat earthers, and they would either try to avoid answering the question or they would outright deny what I was presenting as my evidence. So in the case of the Southern Flights, one of our guests, live on the air, we used to broadcast live, I brought up this problem of the Southern Hemisphere Flights and he said to me that I can't have taken that flight because it doesn't exist. And I said, well, with the greatest of respect, I think the flight does exist because I've taken the flight. And he said, well, you must be mistaken. So then I went and got my itinerary, which I had saved from that trip. I went and got it from my little collection of things from the past. I came back. I sat down at the microphone. This is all live on the air. And I said, here's my itinerary. I could be making this up, but let me tell you what I remember happening and what I've got documentation to show happened. And still, he didn't want to accept it. Now, I would have thought that because I was challenging some of these flat earthers in their claims, that people would be able to see that I was not a flat earther. And yet, to this day, I still have people trying to say that I promoted flat earth or that I am a flat earther, even though that's the complete opposite of what I was saying. So I can completely understand your frustration with this flat earth thing that has taken over conspiracy culture. I get it. At the same time, though, I think if we try to say that anyone who questions things like war or dinosaurs or even heliocentrism itself, if we say that any of those people who question these things are falling into the same trap as flat earthers, then that seems to me to be almost like a guilt by association or a throwing the baby out with the bathwater. I think if you do skepticism properly, if you have a proper methodological approach to the matter, well, you won't arrive at flat earth because the evidence goes against it, but you need to be willing to look at the evidence and you need to be willing to do the research. And so it was only through doing the research that I came to my current position, which is that the heliocentric model that we're given today, I do think it is fanciful. But that doesn't mean that I accept flat earth. And I consider myself to be one of the leading flat earth skeptics in the world today. So that's where I'm at with all of this. Greg, I, I'm a skeptical person. I take the time to look at the official stories for some of these things. And I'm not rejecting them out of hand. So if I say war hoax, I'm not saying that all war is a hoax. And you could say that maybe I shouldn't use the word hoax then. It's too strong a word. I completely understand that. But at the same time, we live in a world where people are convinced of the most ridiculous things because of their conditioning through school. So to counteract that, what do we say? Do we say, oh, I'm, I'm a war questioner or I'm a war skeptic or I think war might be a deception? Well, just using terms like war hoax, it just cuts right through that and it says, right, I am willing to say that I think we've been deceived about war right from the get-go. If people don't like the use of the word hoax, I understand that. Hopefully they can understand why I do that. 
war hoax, evolution hoax, heliocentrism hoax. It cuts right to the chase and it says, look, I'm willing to put my cards on the table here. I no longer believe what I used to believe. And the reason for this is because I've taken the time to look into the official story and I do not find it convincing. And that's fair to say. And I'm with you on the conventional model. There's a lot of things that don't add up when you start to pick at it. So we're probably on the same page there. And I'm glad you brought up that show with Gordon White because I've gotten a lot of feedback from all sides of the spectrum on how people feel about that and a lot of pushback. And I think maybe some of the points I made them casually and maybe made them too strong, but I think people misinterpreted what I was saying to a point, which was really that when I grew up in this culture, it was about trying to improve my own life, about avoiding debt traps and achieving economic fairness or escaping the cog in the wheel lifestyle, finding healthier options and creating solutions away from the weaponized food and water and now cell phones that we have to deal with, you know, things that can help us navigate to a better reality, even if it's just in our small circle. And I'm not sure these other topics like atomic weapons or dinosaurs or the flat earth, I'm not sure they do that. And I'm not saying questioning has no merit. Of course, I would never say that. But I just think it should be maybe measured and maybe it's gone a little bit off the rails and maybe people are obsessing over things they can't control at the expense of their own life and their own health and making themselves a better person. And it's not that all time is spent wisely either. So it's not even fair to say, you know, you should spend your time more wisely because of course we have a lot of time and it isn't all spent wisely. So that's of limited use to bring up, but that's kind of where I was coming from on a lot of that stuff. Craig, I completely understand what you're saying and I can relate to it and I can empathize with it. And you're correct. A lot of people, whether it is flat earth or it is pizza gate or any of these sorts of things, a lot of people do let it take over. Maybe not their lives, but their interest in the alternative. And so when I got into all of this, I was the same as you. I got into this thinking, well, I've been deceived about things. What else have I been deceived about? And there was a reason I wanted to do this because I wanted to improve my life. If I have been deceived about something, I want to know what else I've been deceived about and hopefully improve my life as a result. And so in the last couple of years, for example, I've improved my diet significantly because I realized I had been deceived about nutrition and health. Right. And I've improved my exercise regime because I had been deceived about the ideal exercise regime. So now I sit here at the age of 31 and I'm in significantly better shape and significantly better health and better strength and fitness and flexibility than I was five or six years ago when I was in my mid-20s. And that's not because I was a couch potato in my mid-20s. I used to exercise then and I thought I was being healthy back then, but I had been deceived. And so by being willing to reconsider what I thought I know, I have been able to make positive changes in my life. And so I can completely empathize with people who say that this flat earth thing or the QAnon thing or the Pizzagate thing, it is distracting people. Because, yeah, how do these things improve your life? If you decide that the earth is flat, for argument's sake, putting aside whether or not you're correct about that, and of course I say that flat earthers are incorrect, but let's just say they were correct, for argument's sake, well then what? How does it improve your life to know that the earth is flat? In and of itself, I don't see how that does benefit you, other than it allows you now to feel as though you've got all of these friends. and so. What I noticed when I was studying the flat earth phenomenon through 2015, 2016, 2017, a lot of people, they do come to identify with the conspiracy or with the alternative theories that they have adopted. And now because of Google Hangouts and how easy it is to communicate with people all around the world, they form their own online enclaves. And it almost becomes, I don't want to use the word like a cult, but it almost becomes people, they find this new group identity. And then anyone who challenges that, they see those people as like an outsider and a blasphemer. And so in all the time that I've been doing this, and I cover so many different topics, and a lot of my perspectives are controversial, in all of my time doing this, 
there's only been two occasions where myself or a family member or a friend has been Facebook stalked and had their personal details shared by somebody who was uh, angry at me for my work. And on both occasions, it was flat earthers who did that. A flat earther Facebook stalked a family member of mine and they shared their details publicly. And a different flat earther Facebook stalked a friend of mine and same thing, released his details publicly, accused him of being a deceiver. I mean, this is pretty full on stuff when ultimately all I'm doing is saying to people, here's my research, here's my reasoning, here's my questions. Let's have a chat about this. For people to go to those kinds of links, it shows that this is more than just an exploration for them. This is more than just questioning what they think they know or questioning how they've been deceived. This has become something of an identity for them. And that's not what I got into this for, Greg. I never got into this to take up a new identity as a believer of this thing or as a promoter of that thing. I just got here to find out, well, how have I been deceived and how can I improve my life? And so when I was listening to your chat with Gordon, I thought, I can relate to this, Greg. Even if you're saying that the dinosaur hoax is a distraction, whereas I think it's actually a very important topic that is worthy of our time, I did get where you were coming from because who wants to tell their friends and family now that they're into alternative theories if the first thing that you're going to be told in response is, oh, then you must be a flat earther, right? It's, I can completely understand that frustration. My hope is that by the end of this call, you and your listeners will understand I'm not feeding into that. I'm doing the opposite. I do consider myself to be the world's leading flat earth skeptic. So the same skeptical approach that I take to dinosaurs or to history, I take that to flat earth as well. And one of the reasons why you won't see so many flat earth skeptic videos on my YouTube channel is that once I'd released 50 of these videos, I thought to myself, I've done enough of this now. Every time I release a flat earth skeptic video, every time I release a video saying, here is the argument of the flat earthers, here is the empirical evidence that contradicts it, here is how they are wrong. Every time I did that, it felt like all I was doing was giving Flat Earth more attention. It actually felt like I was feeding the beast. So after my 50th, my 50th Flat Earth skeptic video, I said, that's it, I'm finished with this. I recorded a two hour show where I just reviewed all of those videos and I left that video up on my website. And I actually set almost all of the other videos to unlisted on my YouTube channel just to disassociate myself from Flat Earth. Because I realize now that even by questioning Flat Earth, in some ways, all you're doing is helping them. So uh, I guess the point I'm trying to make here, Greg, is that I feel like I can empathize with your frustration. But at the same time, I just don't feel like the work that I'm doing, I don't feel like I'm part of the problem. I actually kind of feel like my approach is part of the solution. Fair enough. I mean, hey, I agree to some extent or you wouldn't be here. So I think that's really well said. And I really kind of want to get into the meat of things because, man, time is just going by so quickly and I am enjoying this. But history is clearly a big topic. The existence of dinosaurs would fall into history. Our concepts of human development, hunter-gatherer societies, ancient Egypt, Greece and Rome, megalithic structures, indigenous cultures. I mean, it is a huge body of material that you're casting doubt on really the whole human story as it's generally accepted, how do we introduce people to something like this? How do you tend to lay a base for the history hoax itself? Excellent question. So one of the things that I like to do is to read out a quote from George Orwell, because most people will tell you that they're familiar with the story of 1984 by George Orwell. So here's a quick quote from that book. If all others accepted the lie which the party imposed, if all records told the same tale, then the lie passed into history and became truth. Who controls the past, ran the party slogan, controls the future. Who controls the present, controls the past. And again, that's from 1984 by George Orwell. When you were going through school, Greg, did you find it strange how often the textbooks would change? Did you ever find that interesting how every few years the textbooks for a particular class you would have to go and buy a new textbook. You couldn't use one from 10 years ago that was out of date. Did you ever notice that? Yeah, I mean, in grade school, I think it's a little bit different here, but I know what you're saying. Yeah, they definitely change all the time. 
Yeah, well, maybe it is different in your part of the world, but here in Australia, it was often the case that a child couldn't use the textbooks from his older brother because by the time he got to the same class, the books had changed. Now, there is a commercial, I guess, incentive behind this. If you constantly change the textbooks and the parents have to keep rebuying new textbooks, then it means more money for the publishers of the books and these kinds of things. So there is a commercial element to it. What I'm getting at, though, is if the textbooks are constantly changing, then every new cohort of children is getting a new version of history. And most parents today do not have a very hands-on approach to their children's education. They send their children off to school and they trust that the children will be taught the truth. They'll be taught what they need to know. And so what I'm suggesting is that it's actually very easy for what we think is history to change on a regular basis, even through school. And then if you pay attention to the news, you'll notice that every now and then there'll be a news story about, oh, the experts have found this new piece of archaeological evidence that suggests that the timeline goes back even further than we thought. So to use one example, when I was in school as a child, and I'm only 30 years old, by the way, Greg, I turned 31 this month. We were told that the indigenous Australians, the natives who were here before colonialism, that they had been here for about 20,000 years. That was a story that we were told at school. I've spoken with my friends and I've spoken with other people who are my age who went to different schools to me, and that's how they remember it as well, anywhere from 20 to 40,000 years. Well, just last year, there was a news story saying that there was new archaeological evidence that puts the timeline back to maybe 75,000 years. And in the interim, in the 20 years between my school and this news story, there were several other news stories on an intermittent fashion. And each one of them put back the history another few thousand years. So we're at the stage now where someone my age, 30 years old, who remembers being taught that the indigenous had been here for 20,000 years, that history has now been pushed back to 70,000 years according to the experts, as their stories are told through the mainstream media. So right from the outset, I find myself wondering if history can change that much in the space of 20 years, or how much has history changed before my time? If I was being educated in the 1990s, how different was our history from what was being taught in, say, the 1950s or the 1960s or the 1970s? And who would even know? Who is taking the time to say, guys, look how fast history has changed here. Maybe this is a pattern. Maybe this has been happening for some time. So what this has led me to do is to go and look into some of these things, some of these stories that we're told about history. And in particular, I've been looking at ancient Greece, ancient Rome, and ancient Egypt. And what I have discovered, Greg, has shaken me to the core (laughs) of my miserable soul. I have discovered that it turns out that things like Egyptology didn't even exist more than 130 years ago. Egyptology itself, the study of what we call ancient Egypt, is only 130 or 140 years old. Now, on its own, that might not sound so controversial, but if we look at where these people get their views from, What is their evidence? What are their primary sources for the claims that they give us about ancient Egypt? What I have discovered has led me to the inference that this is all a relatively recent fabrication. Now, before I go further, Greg, can I ask you, if I say to you, ancient Egypt, what do you imagine in your mind? Okay, (laughs) If I say to you those two key terms, ancient Egypt, what kind of images come to mind? What does your mind associate with the term ancient Egypt? (laughs) I generally think of people who had a pretty evolved spirituality, pharaohs, mystery schools, and of course the images we get from Hollywood and artist depictions make it seem like a desert oasis with gold and jewels everywhere, that sort of stuff. Yeah, exactly. The same with me. If someone says to me, ancient Egypt, I'm thinking about pyramids, I'm thinking about people doing funny little dances with their hands up to the front and back to the side. And I'm thinking of lots of sand. I'm thinking of maybe slaves or were they workers? Who built the pyramids? Were they slaves or were they paid to be there? Well, 
whoever they were, they must have worked very hard to move all of those stones into place. These are the kinds of things that I'm thinking about. And I'm thinking about it all happening thousands of years ago. So let's explore where do we get the idea that ancient Egypt is thousands of years old? Where does that idea come from? Have we taken the time to study the sources for these claims? Or have these ideas been put there by school and by television and even to an extent by conspiracy culture? Well, let's fast forward a little while through my research, through the things that I've discovered. What if I were to tell you, Greg, that according to the official historians, if you trace their sources, that is, you open up a history book and it says that, say, a particular pharaoh from ancient Egypt is from 4,000 years ago, for argument's sake, and you decide, I'm going to look into the evidence for that claim. How do they know what he said? How do they know that he was there 4,000 years ago? What's their evidence? So you go to the back of the history book, you go to the reference section, and you find their sources. Then you go and look up those sources. Right, what's your evidence that this is what happened thousands of years ago? And you continue this process, just tracing through the sources to the actual evidence. Not the story of what happened, but the evidence on which that story is based. What if I told you that if you do that, the evidence goes back to a thing called the Oxyrhynchus papyri from the late 1800s that were discovered by two Oxford scholars in what they claim to have been an ancient Egyptian rubbish dump. That is, that their sources for a lot of the stories that we're told about ancient Egypt and even ancient Greece, these primary sources, the sources that supposedly come from the time of ancient Egypt and of ancient Greece, those sources are claimed to have been discovered by two Oxford scholars named Grenfell and Hunt in the late 1800s in what they claim to have been an ancient Egyptian rubbish dump. Does that sound like it is even possible that that could be the case? Or does it sound like I must be making this up? <laughs> well, from going over your work already, I'm familiar with that argument. And I guess it's suspect, but I wonder, and I'm not an expert, but there's more documents than just this particular papyri that our concepts of ancient Egypt are based on. I mean, we can see the pyramids, so they're there, and they look like they're somewhat old. I don't know how to really date erosion, but they also had a language that is no longer in use. And I feel like there's some depth there to just create or fabricate out of thin air. No? Well, that's exactly right. So when you first present to people this idea that if you trace the sources, so you've got official historians who have their stories about what happened in the past, if you trace their sources back to the primary source, that oftentimes it goes back to a rubbish dump from the late 1800s discovered by two Oxford scholars, the first response I think will naturally be no, 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 there must be other documents. There must be. <laughs> and so let's explore that further. We assume there must be more documents because why? Because we've been told all of these stories throughout our life. We've seen them on TV. We went to school. We were given all of these stories about the past. We assume there must be more evidence. There must be more documentation. So if somebody comes along and they say to us, yeah, that's what I thought. I thought there must be more evidence. <laughs> so I spent hours and hours and hours searching for it and I couldn't find any, every single time the primary sources trace back to relatively recent so-called discoveries, our natural inclination is to say to that person, no, you must be missing something. There must be more evidence that you've missed. What our natural inclination isn't to do is to say, I'm going to disprove him. I'm going to get a history textbook. I'm going to check their references. I am going to trace the sources myself, and I'm going to discover sources that are much older than he's claiming there are. Our natural inclination is not to scrutinize history. It is to take the stories that we're told on face value, which is one of the reasons why I don't blame anyone if after hearing me suggest that a lot of these stories go back to a rubbish dump from the late 1800s, I don't blame them if they think that I'm making that up or if they think that I'm exaggerating or embellishing. I don't blame them at all. But what I hope some people will do, and this is why it's terrific that you've got such a wide audience, Greg, Surely some people in your audience are going to say, this John the Bond guy, he must be exaggerating. I'm going to disprove him by getting a history textbook, 
by tracing through the sources right back to the primary source and I'm going to prove that we have evidence that is older than 100 or 200 years. I'm going to prove it. I'm going to disprove JLB. I'm hoping some of your listeners will do that. But I can tell you exactly what's going to happen if they try. They will arrive at the same conclusion as me. History as we know it is all a sham. It's all a sham. As ridiculous as that sounds, as crazy as that sounds, as completely bonkers as that sounds, if you take the time to trace the sources, this is the logical inference that you will draw. It is all a sham. Ancient Egypt, ancient Greece, ancient Rome, all of the stories in our heads, complete nonsense. And the fact that so few of us will ever take the time to check is a reason as to why this is so easy to pull off. If you can convince the masses of all of these stories and none of them take the time to check the sources, then just imagine how easy it would be to deceive the whole lot of them. Hmm. I mean, you're absolutely right, and it is a fair point that it is up to me to present you with counter evidence, and I don't have any ancient Egyptian papyri in which to do that with. I do assume that there are a lot of tablets and tombs and cartouches that do have hieroglyphs on them. I have seen some. I've been to the British Museum. I've been to several museums that have things that they claim are from ancient Egypt, but I really can't prove that they are or aren't. But I guess to play devil's advocate, the printing press, we're told, came along in the 1400s, and I could see that being the internet of its day because information can finally be distributed with ease because before that, everything is handwritten and not really built to last. So these chroniclers, as a method of preservation, had to rewrite these crumbling scrolls and papyri, and sometimes you just won't get your hands on a primary source. These things fall apart with time, I would think. I mean, I can see how you'd be skeptical of all that. It's also a lot of trust to put in people of the ancient past to think that they did an honest job of copying something, but it's just kind of all we have. I mean, is that not a reasonable explanation for why we don't have more primary sources, that the technology wasn't there and people really aren't that concerned with how things are going to be viewed a thousand years past their own life? You know, they're only concerned with their small sliver of time. And this might just be an unfortunate aspect of our progression as a species. Yeah, well, there's a couple of things there. Firstly, I don't actually think it is your job to present me with evidence. I think if you're comfortable with your beliefs, then you don't have to go out of your way to prove them to me. So if I'm saying that I used to completely believe in ancient Egypt, and when I was a child, I loved the TV show Stargate. Do you remember Stargate SG-1 and the original film Stargate with Kurt Russell? I used to love those, and they're largely based on the stories that we have about ancient Egypt. Obviously, those are a fictionalized TV show, but a lot of the narrative of those shows is based on this idea that there was an ancient Egypt, the same way that we're told by history and school and TV, right? And I used to love that stuff. So I used to completely believe in ancient Egypt, and now I don't because I've taken the time to trace through the sources. But that doesn't mean that it's your job or anyone else's job to prove to me that ancient Egypt is real. If you're comfortable with your beliefs, then I say that's totally cool. The problem for me is that I got onto this path when I first realized how easily I had been deceived. I thought, I have to get into the habit now of not basing my evidence on my beliefs, but basing my beliefs on evidence. And that means I have to go and search for evidence. And so with things like ancient history, well, when I was in school, I was given the stories and I was told to memorize the stories, but we weren't actually given the evidence. We were just given the stories. And the stories in and of themselves are not evidence. Just because hundreds or thousands of people repeat the same story, that doesn't make it evidence. What I need to do is try and find the evidence, which is why I found myself trying to trace back through the sources. Here's a history book. Here's what they claim. Let's go to the references. Let's go and get that book. And that's why I arrived at this position now where I say there are no primary sources. This is all make-believe. But that's just my interpretation now, having tried to find the evidence and seeing that there was none, that it was a complete sham. This is the interpretation I've come to. But that was just because that was a skeptical path that I was on and that I am on. But this isn't necessarily the path for everyone. 
because as humans, we have to find meaning in the world. And sometimes these stories about ancient Egypt or ancient Rome or ancient Greece, sometimes these stories can give us a sense of meaning. And so who am I to come along and say, I've looked for the evidence and I find it completely unconvincing now that I've looked for it and seen what the actual evidence is. It's a joke. Who am I to say, oh, now you have to also let go of your beliefs in ancient history? No, no, not at all. People can believe whatever they want. And this is why my website and my YouTube channel, they will always be niche within the broader conspiracy culture realm or within the broader alternative realm. Because what I'm doing is I'm saying, look at all these stories that we have. A lot of them are based on zero evidence or very uncompelling evidence. So let's stop believing in those stories. But that's almost antithetical to the usual human condition, which is to believe in stories, which is to take stories on face value, to assume that the experts have evidence. I've never seen the evidence, but there's lots of experts, so I'm sure they've got the evidence. That's the natural human condition, and it helps give people meaning in their life. And I'm not trying to take that away. When I was a little bit younger and a little bit more naive, I was on that kind of crusade. I was thinking, no, everybody should base all of their opinions on evidence that they have checked for themselves. Nobody should take silly stories on face value. I got a little bit self-righteous a year or two ago, but with the benefit of hindsight and with experience, I can see now that a lot of these stories do give people meaning and ultimately all any of us want to do is be happy. And so I'm happier being a skeptic and looking for the evidence and tracing back through the sources. I'm happier doing that, but I'm unusual in that sense. So I'm not saying that it's your job to find the evidence to convince me, Greg. What I am saying, though, is that if people want to say that their opinions are based on evidence, then it is incumbent on them to check for the evidence, to check the sources. So really, people have to make a decision. Are they going to base their opinions on evidence? Are they going to spend the time scrutinizing the sources? Or would they rather continue to believe what they believe? And I think both choices are perfectly reasonable, but they are different choices. There is a distinction between someone who will take the time to search for the sources and someone who will take the stories on face value. There is a difference. There is a significant difference between the two. There is. It is a distinction worth mentioning. But that simple question still remains of, doesn't the unfortunate reality of technological progression have to be folded into the analysis? Isn't it kind of disingenuous not to? Well, I'm glad you bring that up because for me, this is a very exciting time to be alive because of what technology offers us. For example, when I went and looked into this story of Herodotus, Herodotus is this important figure of ancient history because according to historians today, Herodotus was the first historian. He's considered to be the father of history. He was the first man to accumulate information about what had happened before his time and write it down so that future people could know about his time and before his time. He's considered to be the father of history. Now, 50 years ago, if I wanted to look into the story of Herodotus as somebody living in Brisbane, I would have been in a lot of trouble. I would have had to have jumped on a boat and gone over to England and gone through the Oxford Libraries or the Cambridge Libraries to trace through the sources. And of course, that'd be too much trouble. So instead, I would just rely on my third hand evidence, on my tertiary evidence, the tertiary sources, such as encyclopedias or these kinds of things. And I would have to take their interpretation or their account of the primary sources on face value. Well, now in 2018, thanks to things like the Internet Archive, a lot of the books that go back 100, 200 years ago, on which modern textbooks are often claiming are their sources, those have been uploaded now as PDFs for anyone to check for themselves. So when I was searching through the sources for Herodotus, I was able to discover, oh, okay, modern books are all citing this author from 1950. Let me go and find his book. Ah, I see. In his book, he cites as his evidence a writer from 1900, for instance. Okay, let me go and find a copy of his book. Within a few minutes, I had a PDF copy of his book. So I was able to read that book, find out what he was claiming. What is he claiming is his sources. And so I was able to go through this process of just tracing back through the sources. Yes, it still takes a lot of time to read all of these books, 
but I have instant access to them. And so in the space of a day or two days or three days or however long it takes me to read all of these books and find out all of their sources, I'm able to arrive at the start, the start of the story. Who was the first person who claimed that Herodotus said or did what Herodotus is claimed to have said or done? And so with technology now, anybody who wants to take a skeptical approach to history can do so from the comfort of their local cafe or from the comfort of their own home. They can access books that are stored in libraries in, say, London or in, say, the north east of America in one of your prestigious universities, we can now access all of those in PDF form, in digital form, instantly, which means that now for the first time in recorded human history, anybody can check the validity of these stories. And I kind of feel like I'm one of the first people to do this. So even though I completely understand that 90 or 95% of the people who ever hear this podcast will just assume that I'm crazy or just assume that I'm making things up for dramatic effect or whatever, there will be a small percentage of people who will say, I'll give this a try. I will go to Internet Archive and I will see if I can trace back the sources for myself. And when they do that, they will arrive at the exact same conclusion as me, which is that this is all a sham. But this is not something that people even 20 years ago really had access to. I mean, the Internet Archive, for instance, was only created in 1996, I think, by a fellow called Brewster Kale. So a person in my situation, say in the 1980s, if there was someone living in Brisbane or living in your part of the world who was skeptical about the stories of history, he would have to travel to libraries in person to check what was in those books. So the process that I'm going through now, this skeptical approach to history, it wasn't even possible a few decades ago. It is possible now, and I think slowly but surely more people are going to try this if for no other reason than to debunk me, if they say, I'm going to do this to debunk JLB, great, fantastic, because they're still going to arrive at the same conclusion. It's not like I just did this once and said, aha, history is fake. I've done this with so many different characters of ancient history that I've now come to the inference. It's not just Herodotus, and it's not just Plato, and it's not just Caesar, and it's not just Tutankhamun. Every single time I trace through the sources, I arrive at a brick wall. I arrive at a wireframe mesh. I arrive at a source from a couple hundred years ago who himself cites no other sources. This is all a fabrication. <laughs> Provocative, man. And I, I do like your confidence. And I wanted to talk to you about history as a discipline a little bit in our top universities. So let's get into Oxford and Cambridge a bit. From your own site, you write, I began by going straight to the top, Oxford University, according to its about page. As the oldest university in the English-speaking world, Oxford is a unique and historic institution. There is no clear date for its founding, but teaching existed at Oxford in some form in the year 1096 and developed rapidly from 1167 when Henry II banned English students from attending the University of Paris. And then you say, that is one old university, well over 800 years old, they claim. Somehow they don't actually know when they themselves were founded, which ought to raise some red flags. And to loop in Cambridge here, you say Oxford created their history professorship in 1724. Cambridge also created a modern history professorship in 1724. Britain's two oldest and most prestigious universities both established their professorships in modern history in the very same year, less than 300 years ago. What a coincidence. And... I will admit, that is pretty interesting, right? Yeah, so in that piece, and I should explain to the listeners, I've now got seven pieces on my website, seven articles that I've written on what I call the history hoax, and they follow a logical structure. So I start off with my history hoax, a primer, and then the next article is the history of history, and the second history in that title has inverted commas, because we think of history as being this distinct academic discipline, which must have been going on since humans first learned to write. However, if we look into the academic discipline of history, it turns out that they fully admit that this is not the case at all. And even I was surprised when I first found out that the American Historical Association, the AHA, they themselves fully admit that history as an academic discipline only began in the late 1800s. 
And so when I read that on their website, I thought, that can't be the case. History as a discipline must go back further than that because supposedly the universities do. So I went to the university's own websites and to the history faculty uh, sub websites of these universities. And what I discovered was exactly what you just said. Both Oxford and Cambridge say that their first professor in history didn't come along until 1724, the exact same year. So independent of each other, both Oxford and Cambridge claim that their first professor of history, he became a professor in 1724. And both of them also say that they didn't start taking undergraduate classes or they didn't start allowing undergraduate examinations in history until another 150 years after that. So the modern academic discipline of history that many of us might assume goes back hundreds or thousands of years. No, it doesn't. The academic discipline of history, as we know it today, is itself a relatively new creation compared to what we think is human history, which in and of itself is not necessarily incriminating, but it got me looking further again. And then I found out that Oxford can't even tell us when they themselves began as a university. So the institutions, the establishment institutions who are trusted to tell us what was happening thousands of years ago, they can't even tell us when they themselves first began as a university. Now, again, none of this proves that history is a hoax on its own. I'm not claiming that it does. But these are the kinds of things that when I found them out, led me to go and search into things further. Well, I think there are good points there. And I know that this is just a building block and it does have some surprising differences from many assumptions people probably have out there. But it's kind of steeped in the English-speaking world when, at least on your site, you're talking about the American Historical Association, these major universities like Oxford and Cambridge. But as big as it might seem now, that's kind of a small sliver of humanity. English was only developed in 1066. How far back would this kind of discipline go? I mean, what about Latin, Chinese, Hebrew, Sanskrit? Are these not part of the human story? Do you think these are recent inventions that were then backcasted? Well, that's a good question. Where does our language come from? Where does English come from and how old are these languages? And when I looked into that question, what I found out was that the way that they try to tell us how old languages are, it often involves things like simple diagrams showing that this word in this language sounds similar to this other word in this other language and this other word in this other language. And then they draw little arrows between them and they say that the experts infer that this word must have led to that word and so on and so forth. And that's how we arrived at what we believe are the histories of these languages. Now, I completely understand how difficult it must be to untangle this, to untangle how old are the languages. That's kind of the point of what I'm making here is when we actually think about how difficult it must be to determine where our languages came from, why would we then be so quick to just take on face value whatever is the current official story about these things? So I don't know how old the English language is. I don't know how old Latin is or Hebrew or these kinds of things. What I can tell you, though, is bringing it back to the history hoax element, once upon a time, so goes the story according to Cambridge and Oxford and these kinds of places. Once upon a time, when you were being taught history, you had to know how to speak Greek. You had to know how to speak Latin. That was part of your training in the classical studies. These days, you can graduate with a three-year history degree without having to know a single language other than English. And to me, that ought to raise a red flag for people because what that means is that if people like Herodotus or people like Tutankhamun or people like Caesar or any of these characters of history, if they or their contemporaries were writing in their own language, then there's no way that we could read it for ourselves. We would have to read, at the very best, a translation in English. Now, that doesn't mean that we can't know what those people were saying, but if we're only reading English and those people supposedly wrote in other languages, then we ought to be skeptical or critical of, well, where does that translation come from? Who performed the translation? Why would I take this translation on face value? And what I'm suggesting is that if we go through that process, if we say, right, what is 
considered today to be the best translation of their works, let's go and find a copy of that book. Once we find that book, let's find out where does that author claim that they got their original Herodotus from or their original Caesar or their original Tutankhamun or any of these characters of history? What is their translation based on? Where is the original? And what I discovered when I went through this process is that in many cases, there is no original. So let's use one example, Herodotus. If you look up the story of Herodotus today, you'll be told that we know what Herodotus was saying and we know what Herodotus was documenting. Okay, great. What is this story based on? We'll find out that the official story says that we've got books from 1850. There's a guy in 1850 who wrote a terrific translation of Herodotus's work. Fantastic. Let's get a copy of that book, which we can do now, thanks to the Internet Archive. Let's find that book and read that and find where does that guy say he got his original Herodotus. If we follow this process, at the end of that line, you'll find people writing books maybe 200 years ago, but they give no source whatsoever for what they're saying Herodotus wrote. Nothing. Nothing at all. I know how outrageous that sounds, but that's what I have discovered by tracing through the sources. That's where I'm at right now. So you make a good point about English and Hebrew and Latin and these kinds of things. If someone says to me, hey, I've got a copy of what Herodotus wrote, and it is in his native language. Here you go. Great. I would love to see that. But from the research that I've done, there is no such thing. The closest that we have are the Oxyrhynchus papyri, which, as I said earlier, were discovered in Egypt in the late 1800s by a couple of fellows from Oxford which they claim to have been written by the original authors, but they say was found in a rubbish dump, basically in an empty area of Egypt. Okay, So the closest that we have to primary sources were discovered 120 years ago in a rubbish dump by two Oxford scholars. In the meantime, all the stories we've got about Herodotus, they lead us to believe, oh, these translations must be based on the original. But if we look through the sources of the translations, they don't tell us what they were translating from. I mean, this is a big deal, Greg. How do I put this? Hopefully you and your audience can see why I think this is a big deal. This is not a distraction. This is not some kind of put on that I'm doing. To me, this is a big deal. If we have been deceived about what we think we know about ancient history, that is a huge deal. And it's instructive of the modern human condition that so many of us can spend so many years believing these stories without spending so much as a single afternoon checking the sources for those stories. Fair. And I do agree that this is a big deal. I mean, that's why of the topics on the table, I wanted to focus on this because history, of course, is relevant to our lives. And I also, of course, think there are major deceptions in history. I think our only disagreement is scale. And if we were to talk about ancient Egypt a bit more, as an example, like I look at the work of John Anthony West or Robert Schock, right? I mean, they're famous for questioning the official narrative of Egypt by pushing it back much farther and making a case that it was much more complex and exceptionally advanced in their cosmology and spiritual understandings than it's typically presented. And it was Robert Schock who really had no dog in the fight. He's an expert on weathering. And he looked at the Sphinx and said, this damage on it is clearly water erosion. So then you take the date back to when there was rain in the Egyptian desert, again, an assumption, and that puts the Sphinx way back even before conventional history. Those are kind of the ways I think the lies have been told and where the truth might lie. But I guess you think guys like this are either part of the deception or working on faulty premises themselves? Well, I don't want to speak about John Anthony West or Robert Schock specifically, I don't want to criticize or critique their claims because I haven't engaged with their work directly. Fair. What I would ask you though, Greg, is if you found their work convincing, can you recall any of the primary sources that they might have had to put forward about the ancient characters of history? Or was their work specifically about the erosion of the objects that we call the pyramids and the sphinx? What were their claims based on? Right. And that's why I chose this as an example, because it is just about the Sphinx. It's about the enclosure of the Sphinx and the markings that are on it. Because I guess the assumption is the Western world stumbled upon this shit and they're like, what is this? How far back does it go? 
And conventional Egyptology puts the stuff around 5,000 years old. Robert Schock looked at it as a weather damage expert and said, actually, this is water erosion, which it doesn't rain in Egypt like you'd think it does. You know, it's, I mean, it's the desert. It doesn't rain like that now. So for this damage to have occurred, there's an assumption that there was actually a river there, that the Sphinx was near it, and that it was once lush. And so you have to take that back to something like 12,000 years to get it into the right place in which rain would be falling there. And so, of course, I'm, you know, a lot of assumptions here, but the point is that there are markings on the Sphinx that got there somehow. One expert who's an alternative guy who the mainstream has tried to shut down quite a bit, and I know they run, they run counter narratives too, I wouldn't dismiss that, but he says this damage is done by water erosion. You move it back in history, some people would say it aligns with the constellation Leo, that it originally had a lion's head. And some of these pieces start to come together in an alternative way that mainstream Egyptology dismisses. So they're fighting that narrative. Again, could be a counter narrative. But that's why I chose the example of the Sphinx's erosion, because it's kind of simple. It doesn't really require the tracing back of documents and scrolls that might have disintegrated over time or something like that. Yeah, I completely understand. It's a good example, too, because a lot of what I'm talking about has to do with the sources in the terms of a literal sense, like what is the literary evidence for what we think we know about history. So those things can be easily fabricated and a person can claim that a piece of papyri is 2000 years old, when really it might be significantly less than that. Whereas some of these physical relics, such as the Sphinx or the pyramid, well, how can you fake how old they are? And that is a terrific question. I guess my point would be, what is our control? If you think about your typical way of trying to measure something, oftentimes it's useful to have a control element. Now, in the case of the Sphinx, you and I don't have a 2,000-year lifespan to build a Sphinx and then see how much does it erode in 10 years or in 100 years or in 2,000 years, right? We don't have a way to test to see how quickly something like that would erode. So if someone tells us that the erosion that has happened to it is the result of 100 years or 500 years or 2,000 years or maybe 10,000 years, what do we compare that to? What can you or I compare that to? We can either take what they're saying on faith or we can say, well, this guy can't convince me because how long has he been observing the erosion? I mean, if he was to observe the erosion for 10 years and notice, for argument's sake, X millimeters of erosion at this particular point in the object in 10 years, then you could see how they can draw an inference. They can extrapolate from that. Well, here's how far back we think the erosion goes. Now, again, I haven't dealt with John Anthony West or Robert Schock's uh, material, so I don't know what their method was for telling us what the erosion reveals about the age of the objects. Can you remember, Greg, when you were reading their work or when you were interacting with their work, like did they present a method of that nature? Like, how did they arrive at thousands of years? What was the method that they were employing? Well, I think it just relies on his general opinion as a weathering expert. It doesn't rely on any dating except the presumptions about climate in previous ages, I think. Again, big assumptions. But I always found that alternative theory interesting. And then it gets into the size of the head being too small. And if you take it back to that time, it would have better aligned with the constellation Leo, and that would have made more sense. I know that makes some assumptions about the night sky too, but I see a couple pieces coming together in a way that makes sense and is very different from the mainstream. But regardless of that, you have used this term wireframe mesh a couple of times, and I know what you're talking about because I've seen these pictures online that look like black and white photos of people building the Sphinx or a crane lifting Stonehenge into place. And in the same way, you can't trust the chain of custody with some of these documents or the universities that study this stuff. I can't trust images like that in the Photoshop age, even though they are interesting. Maybe these images I'm talking about align with your view, but I don't want to put words in your mouth. So I guess I would just straight up ask you, do you think the megalithic sites of the world are just recent inventions that we're being lied to about? Well, I'm definitely open-minded to that possibility. So if you look at the Sphinx for an example, so if you ask official history, well, what do we know about the Sphinx? 
they'll tell you that the first archaeological dig of the Sphinx took place in the early 1800s. So we're talking about 200 years ago. They'll tell you that it was a character named Giovanni Battista Caviglia who conducted the first archaeological dig that uncovered the Sphinx as we know it today, 200 years ago. So I would think, is it possible that this Sphinx is thousands of years old and it just went unknown, buried for thousands of years before it was discovered? I would say, yes, that is possible. Why not? Is it also possible that a couple hundred years ago, there were some people who either played an elaborate prank or performed some kind of elaborate hoax for their own ends, whether to deceive people or to make money for a tourist venture or whatever the case might be? Is it possible that 200 years ago, they carved something out of stone themselves and told the world that it was thousands of years old? Is that possible? And I would say, yes, of course that's possible. So we've got a few different possibilities here. Now, at that point, the average person feels too busy or they don't feel that they've got the technical expertise to look into the matter for themselves. They're going to want an authority figure to give them a narrative about the Sphinx. So there will be some people who will say, well, the official experts say that it's X number of thousand years old. That's what I'm going to go with. There'll be other people who will say, no, no, there's these alternative researchers who claim that it goes back even further than that, maybe 10,000 years old or 15,000 years old, that's the narrative that I'm going to go with. Then, perhaps sadly, there are some people on YouTube who will say, no, no, my favorite flat earther says that the Sphinx was built by hand 200 years ago. I'm going to go with that. Right. Not because they've done their own research, but because that fits in with their narrative. So people are naturally going to follow whichever explanation for this relic of history. They're going to follow whichever one fits in with their preconceived notions the most. And going back to what I was saying earlier, I don't have a problem with that. If someone says to me that they want to believe or they would prefer to believe or that it just feels right for them that the Sphinx is 10,000 years old or 5,000 years old or whatever the case might be, I'm totally cool with that. But for me, all I can go with is the evidence. And the only evidence I've got is that this thing exists was discovered 200 years ago, even according to the mainstream account, that's when it was discovered 200 years ago. And knowing what I know about how some humans love deceiving others, <laughs> they love to pull off hoaxes, they love to pretend that they've got this pilt down man that proves evolution or whatever the case might be. Knowing what I know about humans, how much some of them love to deceive others, and how easily the rest of them are deceived, I can't help but infer that maybe Maybe the Sphinx was created a couple hundred years ago, but I don't know. I'm not saying that this is the case. I'm saying that I don't know, but I'm not going to believe that it's thousands of years old just because that fits in with other beliefs. That's not the way that I interact with the world around me. But I hope I'm making sense there, Greg. Like I hope you get where I'm coming from. It's like if someone wants to believe that the Sphinx is thousands of years old, I say that's totally cool. All I'm saying is that the evidence that we've got, the empirical evidence, well, all we've really got is the Sphinx. And if someone says, oh, it erodes over a certain time, great. Show me your control. Show me your method. Show me how you've shown that that particular material erodes at that rate over time. I'm happy to look. But in the absence of all of that, all we have is claims and conjecture for something which even the official story admits was only discovered 200 years ago. That's fair. And Robert Shock's not Jesus. And, you know, he could be absolutely wrong. I don't know. It's a difficult thing because I am with you in terms of there being so many deceptions in the past, and it's really hard to parse out where the truth may lie. And I'm not religious about any of my ideas or where I plant my flag. I generally go against the mainstream narrative and find something else in material that's based on something that makes sense to me. And it is a go with your gut type of thing. Because, you know, with what you just said, you kind of put us in a box where if something is a thousand years old, and it works both ways too, because how can Robert Shock be so sure that this is water erosion that happened over the span of lifetimes when you only have one lifetime with which to examine things? But that's kind of a catch-22 as well, because then if something is a thousand years old, you can't know it, I guess. Well, yeah, it's difficult to know. So all we can do is draw inferences. Okay, so 
I'm sure if you were to speak with John Anthony West or Robert Schock, I'm sure that if they were intellectually honest people, and I imagine they are, they would say, well, I don't know how old it is, but my research or my beliefs lead me to the inference that it's thousands and thousands of years old. I'm sure they would be forthright about that, that the best they can do is draw inferences from the evidence, which is all that any of us can do. And so if the inference that they draw leads them to many thousands of years old, again, that's totally cool with me. The point that I would make, though, is that even according to the official narrative, the Sphinx has been restored. So the Sphinx that you see if you go to Egypt, you're not even looking at the Sphinx as it was discovered, let alone as it was supposedly built. So even the empirical evidence, the direct line of sight that you can have of the Sphinx if you go and visit, even that, what you're looking at is a modern version of what was allegedly there thousands of years ago. And I suppose if I can make a point on that, I mentioned earlier that when I was a child, I loved the TV show Stargate and that a lot of the Stargate narrative is based around the narratives that we have of ancient Egypt. And it seems to me the more research that I do and the more that I look into the official stories of things, it seems to me as though there's a lot of myths that are built on top of myths that are built on top of myths, or there are narratives that are built on top of narratives that are built on top of narratives. So to give one example, I know somebody very well, and he's a really cool guy. I love the guy, actually. He's one of the most important people in my life that I've had on this journey so far in my life, someone who has been there to support me doing things that I think are worth doing, trying to improve my life and improve the life of people around me. This guy has done more to support me than most people. He happens to believe in ancient aliens. He happens to believe in the narrative that the ancient civilizations had direct contact with extraterrestrials. You know, the whole Dogon tribe from East Africa, this idea that they knew about Sirius and all this kind of thing. Right. Those are the narratives that he personally believes in. And I think a couple of years ago, when I was maybe being a little bit self-righteous with my skepticism, I think I didn't appreciate that that was how he made sense of the world around us. And that was something that he enjoyed reading the books about. I think he even went to a Von Daniken lecture when Von Daniken came to Australia, or one of these sort of well-known people who talk about these topics. And rather than be supportive of the fact that this story was important to him, I think I was too skeptical in the sense that I said to him, well, what's the evidence for this? What's the evidence for this? At the time, I didn't appreciate the importance of stories to humans. And so right now we're in a situation where a large part of conspiracy culture, and I like that term, by the way, I got conspiracy culture from you. I used to just call it the alternative realm or these kinds of things, but conspiracy culture is a good way to describe it. Mm -hmm. 